Hi, good morning everyone. Thank you for coming to this talk. Um, my name is Natalie Kenley, I'm Director of the National Technician Development Centre. Before we get started, can I just ask you please whether, you, whether any of you are aware of the technician commitment or whether your institutions have signed up to that? Okay, that's brilliant. Yeah, so we're all familiar with that. Um, everyone heard of the Science Council? Yeah, professional registration? Yeah, lots of nodding faces, this is really good. Anyone heard of the NTDC? Yeah, this is brilliant, excellent. So I'm going to give you a really quick whistle-stop tour of the kind of things that uh, we at the NTDC can offer in terms of supporting the technician commitment. Okay, so I'm going to whistle it really quickly. Um, if you want to catch up with me afterwards to talk about any of these separately, that's absolutely fine. Okay. So first of all, to give you some background about the NTDC, so um, if I go back about to about 2015, um, some of you may have heard of something called the Technical Development Modernisation Project. Um, that was a project that was funded by Hefke, um, and it was kind of based in Sheffield, and the guy leading that was a guy called Terry Croft, and I was really fortunate to be able to work with Terry in this project. Um, and we were tasked with coming up with a toolbox of online um, bits and pieces that could support universities and technical communities. At the end of that, um, we were really successful in getting a, a really good set of online tools, and we thought, well, what can we do with this? It either kind of dies, or we do something more with it. We're really fortunate that we managed to get some further funding um, and because of that funding we were able to create the National Technician Development Centre and that was created in 2017. It's co-funded by the University of Sheffield and also by other partners as well. So we're a not-for-profit based organisation so although we do have to cover our costs we're not about making money. Um, we're about supporting universities in the technical community. We've got a core team of staff that are based within the Sheffield office and we've got a, quite an extensive portfolio of advisors that are based across the UK and um, that support us in this. And the great thing about all of us is that we've all been technicians at some time. Um, many of us have transitioned into different roles, we've become managers, we've gone out into industry, we've done all sorts of different things, but at the heart of it we are all still technicians and I think that puts us in a really good place for being able to say we know and understand what technicians face on a daily basis, the challenges that they face nationally and as, um, as a sector, okay? So we, we feel that we're in a really good place to support everyone. So I don't know whether these figures are a surprise to you. If a lot of you work in HE, you may already realise that these are quite staggering figures. We're losing about 50,000 technicians every year through retirement. Um, and the Gatsby Foundation have done some research that suggests that by 2030, we're going to need another 700,000 te 700, technicians. They're quite staggering figures. Um, how are we going to plug these skills gaps? Um, we've still got this problem in terms of lack of recognition and visibility for technical staff. And in some areas, we've still got no clear career pathways, which is quite worrying. There's often a lack of understanding around technical roles as well. So, you know, if I said to people 40 years ago, what was an image of a, a technician, many people would say, oh, it's that person in the white coat who pushes the trolley down the corridor with a load of glassware on and then puts all the glassware out for the, for the lab class and then goes back into the cupboard, a bit like Harry Potter. Um, things are changing, you know, that's not the picture and the landscape that we have today for technicians. Technicians are very skilled, highly qualified individuals who support research and teaching. Um, without those individuals, I think many universities would be really struggling um, to fulfil what they do. Many technicians take, teach, many technicians are authors on research papers, they're really fundamental to what's going on at the universities. So I think it's, it's very time that we um, did something about this and um, made things different. So it's a time for change, really. Um, so one of the things that we can help support institutions with is the roles and responsibilities skills audit. So has, have any of you heard about this particular part of our toolkit, one or two of you are knowing at uh, Noddy. So that's, that's really good. What it does is um, provide universities with a whole portfolio of technical skills and demographics and all sorts of interesting things that a university may want to know. And that can be really useful for collecting that higher level data. I'm going to talk about that a little bit further on into the talk. We've also got something that's called um, a higher education technical taxonomy um, tool. And that's about looking at career pathways and again, I'll talk about that a little bit further on. I'm going to talk very briefly about professional registration. Um, I think if you were at any of Lawrence's talks yesterday, you may have heard about that already. I want to talk about apprenticeships, and I want to talk about um, a new tool that we've got, which has just been launched called CPD Central. 
you know, you'll be able to see that all of these things that I'm talking about actually join up really nicely with the technician commitment. So our aim at the NTDC is to work with people who have already signed up to the technician commitment or are thinking about that to, to really support them in that so that we join that up as a whole and that we support each other. So everything that we can offer really does um, add up to the technician commitment. If you're in the process of creating your 24 month action plans, um, we can really help you in um, putting the right things in your action plan. So the skills audit. So this is something that we put together about three years ago now. Um, it was extensively piloted across the UK with several universities getting involved with this. Um, and what it is, it's an online survey and it's run on something called Qualtrics. So I'm hope, hoping that some of you are familiar with Qualtrics platform. Um, it looks at the wide range of the skills that technicians have. What we're finding is that as I said earlier, a lot of technicians are beginning to retire or move into other areas, and it's leaving those really big gaps um, that we need to fill. How are we going to fill those? So trying to get technicians to come in and fill those gaps, we're finding really difficult. And I know in the area that I work, it's very, very difficult to attract the right people and to get those skills in because technicians' skills are built up over a vast amount of years, and it's very difficult to bring in someone like a graduate who is really competent in those skills that someone's been doing for 10, 15 years. So trying to find people to actually fill these really skilled roles is really, really challenging. Um, we often find that technicians have got what we call hidden skills, and you know they may have acquired those in other areas, they may have got them from different jobs, but they're not actually using them in their day-to-day -day jobs. And being able to highlight those and say, well, actually, you know, you've got skills that we didn't know that you had. Um, we've got areas where we need to plug those skills gaps, and it allows you to move staff around and be much more effective within what you're doing. It also highlights if you've got kind of new projects or new areas of investment that you're um, investing in. You know, do you need new technical skills? What training do you need? So it provides the technicians with an opportunity to say, I'd really like to get involved with that, or I've got the kind of basic skills, but I need this additional training. So it kind of, kind of feeds into that review process at the end of the year when technicians get to talk about what they're doing and where they want to go with their careers. So it's a really, really useful tool. It provides many more... Um, many more really useful bits of information as well and I've got a really nice slide to demonstrate that next I think so another thing that we really struggle on is in terms of technicians you know what do they actually do in terms of teaching many technicians will actually teach um, some people will demonstrate there's clearly the clear definitions around what teaching and demonstrating is but I think it's really important to recognize that a lot of technicians do actually teach when I um, work in my day job at Manchester Met, we have a lot of technicians within the arts areas that actually teach. They do what the academics do, but they're technicians, they're recognised as technicians, and they're not um, given the recognition and value that they actually should, should get for that teaching. So it's important to capture that kind of information. In terms of research, um, you know, what do we mean by research support? Or is that a technician putting out the equipment, setting up a lab or setting up a, a studio or something? Or is it more about collecting that data, analysing the data, and then actually writing part of those research papers and becoming first authors and second and third authors on that? And again, that's really important, collecting that higher level university data. Um, a lot of technicians get involved with widening participation and outreach. And again, that's something that we need to shout about because they are in that capacity. They are shining for that university. They are promoting that university. And that can be really impactful in terms of student recruitment, and student retention, so we need to identify those individuals that are doing that. It's interesting to look at qualifications that technicians have got. You know, years and years ago, technicians weren't really qualified, but nowadays, more than 50% of them have degrees, masters or PhDs. They're very highly qualified, very similar to the academics, but yet there's this, this um, difference or this perceived difference. Again, career plans. Long, long ago, you know, we didn't have that career plan for technicians. Now, we're starting to see things change and technicians' jobs and roles are now being seen as something that's really a great career path to take, something that can be well paid. It gives you the skills to be able to transfer if you want to into industry, into academia, to come back. It gives you a real good basic knowledge. Health and safety. I'm sure that you'll all agree that every one of us has got a health and safety responsibility within our roles, but often that's not captured, you know, and it's often, oh, it's just the technician. The technician can just mop up all this health and safety. It's really important that we identify that because it's really important and it can be very, um, it can be really, very impactful when something goes wrong, you know, it's often the technician that gets it in the neck. 
So finding all this information and more out of the survey is really useful. Um, and from a, a technician's point of view, it's fabulous to be able to put together that portfolio of their skills to be able to say, this is what I'm doing, this is what I'm doing now, but actually I want to get to the next stage, how can I get there? And it's a very reflective process, so it's, it's kind of a two-way two thing. It's really good for the technical staff and it's really good for the university, so it's a win-win. Okay. So the next thing I want to talk to you about is the higher education technical um, taxonomy. So I'm just going to put another one up here. So I think we'll all agree that a technician's kind of career does not go in a nice linear straight line like this. Uh, it's very different to an academic career pathway. Um, you know, it is possible to come in as an apprentice technician here and um, end up as head of technical services or any one of those. But very often it's a very crazy pathway. So people will come in and out of the service, they'll go into other jobs within their area, within their university or department, but they may also go out into academia, they might go into industry and they might come back in again. This is a piece of work that we did to help and support universities in looking at their job profiles and seeing if they can align to this structure. And what you find in a lot of universities that don't have kind of a central service is that you have a lot of technical roles. So you can have, I don't know, hundreds of different technical titles and maybe five of those could actually be the same job, but they've just got a different title. And this kind of helps streamline that and help technical staff see where they are and where they need to get to. So behind this slide is a whole host of competencies which align to these um, images with qualifications that also align to them. So if you were an assistant technician, for example, you could look at that, um, that portfolio of skills and qualifications and say, well, actually, I want to get to a technician role. You know, what do I need to be, to be doing to get to that? Do I need to take some more qualifications? Do I need to do some work shadowing somewhere? Do I need to take, talk to my manager about doing some training to allow me to get to that? Aside each of those as well is um, a professional registration um, award which aligns to those as well. So if you come in um, as an apprentice technician, it's the expectation that after a couple of years you'd have enough skills to be able to apply for a registered science technician. And similarly, get that goes on as well. It gets really interesting when you get to this middle bit here because what you find with technical roles is that you either get really, really specialist and you become so specialist that you can't kind of diversify into management. Blending that management and that specialist role together is very, very difficult. Um, and working with a lot of our partner universities, we've, we've kind of put the idea forward to HR departments that there should be kind of two strands to this. So you can be a specialist, but at the same level, you could also be a manager if that's what you wanted to do. They're starting to become recognition now for that kind of splitting of the role. Okay. So there's a lot of work that goes on kind of behind this slide, but that's just a, a kind of taste of what, um, what that's about. I want to talk to you now about something called CPD Central. So this is our newest online tool, and this at the moment is um, still being piloted. It's still in development, but I'm really something I'm really excited about. So how many of you have to record CPD or do record CPD? Okay, so people are nodding about that. If you've got professional registration, you'll be very familiar with having to record CPD. You have to do it to keep up with your registration. Now, if you're like me, I'm really bad at, at um, collecting my CPD. I have it all in my Google calendar. And when I have to put that in once a year, um, I scrabble through my calendar to try and find what I've been doing and put it all together. It's a real pain. So having this online tool is fabulous because it means that I can just enter that in into my, something similar to a Google Calendar. I can write about what that CPD was, I can write whether I've got a certificate, whether someone signed that off for me or whatever, and I can create this nice online kind of portfolio of CPD. And that automatically maps across to what's required for professional registration. So if you're familiar with that, you'll know that you have to score so many points in so many categories. This kind of does that for you. So at the end of your year, when you have to upload your CPD, you can just print and send it off to your professional body and it's done. Um, it's also really good in terms of um, if you're wanting to write a new CV. So how many times have you seen a job that you want to apply for, you need to update your CV, you look back at it, it's 10 years out of date, oh my God, I'm going to have to spend two evenings or a whole weekend getting this CV up to date. This is really useful because it kind of pulls all that out for you. And yes, there is some work to be doing in putting that together, but kind of gathers all the information together. The other thing that I really like about this, if you are 
into apprenticeships if you are an apprentice manager this can be really useful in terms of how you manage your apprentices so in my day job at Manchester Mayor I manage all our level three and level six and seven apprentices and part of my role is to set them assignments for their 20% off the job training now at the moment I've got lots of paperwork involved with that I'm setting them tasks I'm asking them to do things and things are coming in all at different times this portal allows me to set the task online, say what I want, and ask them to do things within a particular time set, ask them to upload documents, evidence, everything to support that. So I can, I can get all this done online, and I don't have to keep continually thinking about it. The apprentices send this all back to me, it all gets marked, and then at the end of that, it gets sent off to the training provider. So it streamlines that process and it makes it much more effective and efficient from both sides. I think it makes my life easier and I think it makes the apprentices' lives easier as well. So I think that's something that's really exciting. Um, as I say, that's still in development, um, but it's looking really good and I'm sure there's other things that we can do with that as well. So moving on, professional registration. Some of you said earlier that you're familiar with this. Okay, so there's some really nice pictures there from my own teams back at Manchester that have undergone professional registration. So if you're familiar with this, um, you'll find that professional registration is really great for kind of being a springboard for your career. So technical staff, as I mentioned earlier, have got this amazing array of skills that they've built up over many years in, in a lot of cases. But how can they actually prove that competence? You know, they've got the qualifications on paper, but how can they say, yes, I've got 15, 20 years of experience of doing um, HPLC or something? It's very, very difficult. Professional registration is a great way to demonstrate that because it means that you have to go through the whole process of completing a competency form, a very in-depth, um, comprehensive competency form. And if you've been through that process, you'll know that it's, it's not easy to achieve. It takes a lot of time and effort. But at the end of that, it's very worthwhile if you get that award um, that says, yes, you are working at this level. And that can be very powerful and very impactful. It could impact on the individual's um, career. It can actually lead to promotion or um, a new job in some cases. Now, I'm not saying that undertaking professional registration is going to get you that. It has to be self-driven. But it can be very enlightening and into where your skills perhaps are and where you need to kind of um, look. It's a very reflective process, so it allows you to sit and think, you know, what I, actually am I doing? Where do I want to go? How can I improve my skills? Um, it's great if you can get a team of technicians together because once you've got that core team, it tends to spiral. In terms of the institution, I think it's really, it can be really helpful if you've got technicians that are working on research projects and you've got a research grant proposal that you want to put in. You know, people now are starting to put in technicians as name time on those grant applications, and they should be, because otherwise, you know, you're scrambling around for the technician. If they're already named on that grant proposal, you've got that money there. If you can say that those technicians have got professional registration and that they can prove their competence, then that can be really quite powerful. If you've got lots of people competing for that pot of money and you're the grant funding body, you've got technicians that can demonstrate their competence, you're probably more likely to go with those applications. Just a tiny little bit could make absolutely a huge difference. Okay? I don't know whether any of you have had experience of that, um, but certainly everyone that I know in the universities that I work with are starting to put that on their um, grant applications now. So traditionally, professional registration has always been seen as very sciencey, uh, you know, by the very nature of what we call the registers, you know, we've got registered science technician, registered scientist, charter scientist, it all sounds very sciencey, doesn't it? So we're kind of missing out this art sector. In my work that I do at Manchester, 50%, about 100, 120 of the technicians that I work with are arts technicians. And they say to me, you know, we're not scientists, we are artists. And they forget that they are scientists, you know, that the dyes that they mix up and all the processes that they undertake, there's a lot of science behind that. And yes, they can apply for any of the registers that are held, but they don't feel that they really fit with that. So there's some work that I've been doing with the IST to kind of change that and look at creating something specifically for creative arts technicians. So again, they're no different to any other technician. The practicing artists, many of them have got more than 50% uh, more than a, a degree. They're experts in their own field. Many of them often teach. Okay. 
I'm not sure whether this is something that you guys are familiar with, but certainly when I worked at Sheffield in terms of professional registration on our jobs for technicians, we were starting to put down professional registration as an essential or a willingness um, to, to work towards that. At Manchester, it's something that we're adopting. Is anyone else doing that at their institutions? Okay. So it's all really interesting, isn't it? If this is kind of how things are moving, you know, we should all really be thinking very, very um, clearly about this. So just a bit of a snapshot of the registers. So at the moment, we've got three sciencey registers. Um, underneath, we've got their kind of equivalent in a qualification. So this is just guidance. So nobody who goes in for professional registration actually has to have qualifications. So this is just a comparison. Okay. So the kind of entry level R side tech would be something equivalent to about an A level or an MBQ um, or a level three. Registered scientist, a bit higher, HND, higher apprenticeship, and a higher level, um, the chartered scientist is a master's or a PhD level seven. So the creative arts one that I talked about a few minutes ago um, is tagged on at the end. So this isn't this hasn't been created yet. It's kind of this discussions and activities going on to get to that place. At the moment, there is a lot of discussion around what that would actually be called. When we first started on this project, um, we came up with registered arts technician, but that spells rat, so it didn't really go down very well. So we've changed it to something like registered creative arts and media technician. At, at this moment in time, um, the name is, is not really relevant, to be honest. It's something that we can think about. But it, it, it seeks to provide the same registers as for the site one, but more... Um, creative arts focus. With all of these, there's that competency that people need to achieve and keep up with in terms of CPD. So that has to be renewed on a yearly basis. Some lovely photographs here of some technicians that have already got professional registration. So the guys at the top, um, are people from my arts area at Manchester, have been presented with their awards by Helen Sharman at our technical conference this year. Um, left hand side, we've got um, Karen Henderson, who's the director of technical services at Reading with two of her technicians receiving awards and the photograph on the right is technicians at Newcastle. So brilliant to see all those people having gone through that and be role models and um, inspiration for others really so it's lovely lovely to see. So apprenticeships, um, does anyone engage with apprenticeships where they work at the moment? Have you got apprentices in there? Yeah people are nodding. Okay that's good. We know that technicians are vital to teaching and research and they cover all aspects, all disciplines. Really highly skilled workforce, but we do have this ageing um, national profile. 20% of our technicians over the next three or five years are going to retire. Talked about that at the beginning, that's a real problem. So one of the ways to tackle that is by bringing in apprentices. It's a really great start to plug those gaps that you can see appearing. It's a really good way to grow your own technicians. So. <laughs> You know, you can recruit in, but very often you're recruiting in an individual who kind of ticks 80% of what you want, but there's still 20% of the skills that's missing, so you've still got to train that person. Apprenticeships are a really lovely way to, to do that. So just to give you a really quick overview, if you're not quite sure about apprenticeships, they're, they're recruiters through your normal organisational recruitment process, so you have to stump up the salary, okay? So you have to find that. You have to work with an approved government standard, so if you look on the government website, you can find lots and lots of different standards. So just to give you um, a basic one, there's a lab technician one that I use at Manchester, which is really useful. It's a level three apprenticeship. Those individuals that come into your area are paid by the organisation and they're usually paid on a fixed term contract for the duration of the apprenticeship. Okay? It's the training element of the apprenticeship that you can seek the funding for. So any organisation who's got a payable of more than £3 million a year can access the apprenticeship levy. So we're all paying into that levy, but I don't think we're all getting out what we possibly could do if we used it better. Um, I know where I work at Manchester, I'm, we're, the only people, we're the only people within Manchester that are using level three apprentices. So that we're, only, we're the only sector of staff that are using the levy. So... You know, it's, it's vastly underused. And the apprentices themselves, when they come into service, they work alongside experienced staff and they receive training and they go off to college generally one day a week to get that formal training. They also work with the apprentice manager 
do you work on this thing called 20% off the job training? So that kind of supplements everything that's going on. At the end of that apprenticeship, they get a qualification most of the time. Some of the apprenticeships don't, but there is always an end point assessment, so there is always an end point to that. The intention at the end of any apprenticeship is that you know you use those apprentices to plug your own skills gaps, and that's a great way of doing that. I've just had a fantastic apprentice that I've been working with, and he's been absolutely brilliant. I've tried to get him a role within my organisation just as I'm about to do that. He went off and got himself a job out in industry. You know, and that that was a killer for me because I wanted to keep him. He was, he was brilliant, but it's also absolutely brilliant it's so rewarding because it means that whatever we did with that individual we gave him the skills and the opportunities and the chances to go out and get a job somewhere and for that individual who had a really bad start in life and who was really struggling you know I'm really proud that I gave him the chance to be able to get those skills and go on better himself and make his life better for him and his wife and his children so really rewarding getting into apprenticeships. The NTE's part in this is that they are currently developing um, something called the HE Assistant Technician Standard. So this is a partnership between um, kind of education and the NHS in the Trailblazer. Um, it's taken a long time to get approved and it's my understanding that that's being submitted to the IFA for approval. So it takes a long time to get standards approved. In some cases it could take a couple of years to get that and it's really can be really quite taxing and challenging but there's lots and lots that goes into putting those standards together there's more and more standards coming on all the time and I'm sure that's going to get better and better so just to finish off um, I talked at the beginning about the NTEC and how it can support the technician commitment and universities so if you are interested in becoming um, one of our partners you get access to all our tools. So there is a fee that is payable to the NTDC. It's a bit like a subscription fee, and that works on the amount of technicians that you've got within your institution. You pay and it goes up in a tier. It gives you access to the whole team, the whole team's expertise, the tools. Some of the tools do cost. For example, the survey, there is a cost implication to that. And again, it's based on how many technicians that you've got within your organisation. We have got a partner um, forum coming up soon on the 30th of November in Sheffield and within that day there will be talks on kind of what I've focused on in this quick snapshot of a session that we'll be talking about the skills survey, the CPD central apprenticeships and technical careers as well. So if any of you are interested in that, um, please do let me know. This is a list of our partners so you can see we've got some real high hitters there. We've just got a partnership with Western Sydney University which we're really proud of and our partners is Cambridge, Birmingham, Newcastle, Manchester um, you can see if you decide to come on board and join us you're in, in really good company there and we can really support you in, in your technician commitment initiatives and in anything that um, is involving technicians at your organisation really. So if you want to know more we've got a website there Lots of information on there. Um, you can speak to me afterwards if you want. Um, and that's about it from me. Has anyone got any questions? Yeah. Yeah, hi. Uh, if you could go, go back to the current uh, professional registration awards. Yep. This one? Here, yeah. Yes. Well, uh, Excuse me. I have. Hello. Uh, okay, I've got an MS, MSc uh, degree, but my degree suffers from being not from this country. Okay. So, uh, which uh, professional uh, award I should aim for? Um, it depends. What you would need to look at is your job role. So, if you don't mind me asking, what is your job role at the moment? Laboratory research technician. Laboratory research technician. Um, you could fit within all of those, to be honest. And I'm, I'm guessing that if you if you've got that already, that qualification, you've got that high level skill. When we ask people to go in for uh, professional registration and select the register that they, that they think is most appropriate, we ask them to go back over um, about two years of their career. So if you can link what you did in, or what you're doing now within that two-year time frame, then it could be that you could, you could go for something like chartered um, scientists. The beauty about professional registration is if you, if you get it a bit wrong, for example, if you went in for chartered scientist and the assessors didn't think that you were quite in the right place. They'd come back to you and say, you know what, you're doing really brilliantly, but 
at this time we think that you should be going for registered scientists and that works both ways so you can't really get it wrong professional registration is not about turning people down and saying you know we're not registering we want everyone to register and be capable of doing that and it's working with that individual to make make sure that they get the right register really and just because you come in at one level so if you come in a registered science technician it doesn't mean so that you can't move so you know you might come in at that level and then in a couple of years time you might decide that you want to go for a registered scientist or a chartered scientist so i wouldn't i wouldn't get too hung up on kind of where you think you fit with that have a, have a good look at the registers and see what the competency forms looks like and see where you fit within that and if you need any help with that you know either any one of the professional bodies or the science council would be very happy to help and assist you in, in making that choice and working with you to achieve that Thank you very okay, much. that's very welcome. Yeah. I've noticed you've talked a lot about higher education and working within education industries. Can you give us examples of industrial partners you've worked with? Okay, yeah. So um, I think we've got a partnership with MRC Harwell. Um, we're also working with um, Cranfield as well. So it's we've been really focusing on HE to begin with, but we are very mindful that there are you know lots of other avenues out there that we need to explore and technicians in industry and in other sectors that are just as kind of vulnerable and needing that recognition and that um, visibility increase as well. Okay. Yeah, I have this uh, similar question. Okay. Uh, all your examples will be partnerships uh, seem to do with the university. They do, yeah. Um, and of course, industry is being hit as well. So Absolutely. In this Absolutely, so that's right. It is, and it's an area that we want to develop in. I mean, the skill survey that we developed was primarily for HE, but we'd love to make that more industry-focused um, and non-HE, without a doubt. Um, but we are we're still quite new. I mean, we, in our current form, we've only been going for two years, and the team is still quite small. But it is my intention as director to, um, to change that and to diversify and adapt those surveys and the tools that we've got so that it aligns more to external um, rather than you know, close within HE for sure. And the thing is, you mentioned you're going international. Uh, is that the vision? I think so. Um, I can't see why the technicians in other parts of the um, globe are going to be any different to technicians in the UK. And, and certainly the technicians that we're working with in, um, in Australia are facing exactly the same problems. You know, I don't see that the geographical boundaries should be a barrier for us at all. So I, I think... Absolutely. Yeah. This is a fundamental problem in industry throughout the world. Mm, absolutely, yeah. It needs to change. Hi, Natalie. I thought you were <laughs> What can the NTBC do when universities are using technicians leading as a cost-cutting exercise? I mean, you know at Sheffield, we've I lost, do. Well, just in my department, we've mm. lost six technicians over the last four years, mm. from a grade eight to a grade four. Absolutely. Was, and, one, and the grade four is an apprentice that we've trained mm. up, like yours. Absolutely, and yeah. How, how do you stop that moving on? Because we don't have the time, energy, and money to train, and mm. then lose. And Absolutely. We have to put work business plans mm. together to prove that we need replacement technicians. I think I had this conversation, I was down at Southampton earlier this week talking to... Um, they're very high level team there, the kind of UEB team, and we were talking about this. And I think they face this problem as well. You know, they've got, they're becoming management top heavy because they're losing all the, the technicians that do all the work. And that is a massive problem. And I think it's about educating those at a higher level and just keeping on chipping away. And if, you know, if organizations have signed up to the technician commitment, that has to be signed off at a very high level, like the VC level. And you would hope, just by having those conversations with the right steering groups in place, that eventually, over time, this filters through and people do start to hear that, actually, you know, you can't, you can't cut stuff like this. You cannot function. And yes, we can use apprentices to fill some of the gaps, but, you, you know, apprentices are just like anyone else. If they want to leave, they can leave anyway. Um, so it is a big problem. So I guess the best thing I can say is just keep having those conversations. Get onto as many committees as you can as a technician to have that voice to get in there and say you know, we've got this massive problem we need to do something about it it's not, it's not the answer you wanted I know but um, it is a real tough one that. I think it's just about having those conversations and getting the right people in there okay and there's one lady at the back there okay I can see you think you've got registered science technician there can you register as a technician assistant 
Yes, yeah, you can. Yeah. So as I said before, it's not that was just an illustration of kind of comparable qualification. Um, that's just as a comparison to see where it sits. But if you've got that, it's kind of a two year minimum experience. There's no reason why you shouldn't be able to achieve registered science. So they don't have any qualifications no. because they've got two years in a lab. So. Well, in the relevant work area, okay, and that's just for professional registration. For membership, it's a little bit different, but for pure registration, um, you don't actually have to have any qualifications at all. It's, it's based on competency. That's the fabulous thing about it. Um, you don't have to have those qualifications. It's all about the competence that you've built up over that um, career period. And at that level, do they need to get the CD one? Yes, they would do. So moving on to get the second year of registration, you would have to be able to demonstrate that you'd, you'd undertaken your CPD. CPD, I think, sometimes sounds really scary because people tend to think, oh, you know, I've got to be going off and doing this course, I've got to be going out and doing that conference, I've got to be doing all sorts of stuff. But actually, anyone does CPD on a daily basis. You know, if you're teaching students, if you're talking to students, if you're coming to something like this, if you're doing a webinar, it all counts towards your CPD. And, you know, you do need kind of 15 points or thereabouts to re-register as it were but most people have got so many more than that they have to really cherry pick what they put forward for the CPD because most people have got much more than they actually need okay I think we've probably run out of time haven't we I think well thank you for coming everyone it's really nice to um, talk with you if you need to speak with me afterwards it's fine just catch me if you, if you need me for anything else thank you very much